Last week, the DePaul Blue Demons suffered a loss that would probably be deemed catastrophic by nearly any other high major basketball program. In front of a crowd that featured less than a thousand fans, the Blue Demons lost their season opener to Purdue-Fort Wayne, 82-74, and perhaps the worst part of it was that it was kind of expected. Yeah, it was expected, or at least not totally unfathomable, that Purdue-Fort Wayne, a team picked to finish 8th in the Horizon League, would beat DePaul, a Big East school that resides in one of the most iconic basketball cities in the world. And four days later, it got even worse, with the Blue Demons following up the loss against Purdue-Fort Wayne with another home loss to Long Beach State a team picked to finish 7th in the Big West, during which the Blue Demons were down by as many as 20 points before mounting a comeback that fell short in the final seconds, and again, it wasn't a total surprise, as the pregame line was a near pick em on some sportsbooks. Now sitting at 0-2 with a schedule that doesn't get much easier, it looks like DePaul will suffer another long and disappointing season, which unfortunately has become the norm for this program. So how has this happened? It's not like DePaul has always been a disaster. They had George Mikan in the 1940s and Mark Aguirre in the 1980s. They were coached by the legendary Ray Meyer who guided the program for 42 seasons from 1942 to 1984. They've been to two Final Fours in program history and have gotten to the tournament 22 times. There are a lot of major basketball programs that have done less than that. The cupboard isn't totally bare, but there are certainly a lot of cobwebs once you open it. Because over the last two decades, there hasn't been a more consistently disappointing, underwhelming, and downright awful high major basketball team than the DePaul Blue Demons. And to be honest, I don't think it's getting much better. So everyone, meet DePaul the most hopeless college basketball program in America. Ironically, you could argue that DePaul's descent into total despair started with one of the more promising moments in the program's history. In early November 2003, the school made it official that it would be leaving Conference USA to join the Big East starting in the 05-06 season, as part of the conference's expansion that also saw them add South Florida, Marquette, Louisville, and Cincinnati. It was a big jump for the program, but a deserved one. What wasn't to like about the future of DePaul? They were in a great basketball city, they had just hired a new head coach in Dave Valedo who looked to have the program moving in the right direction, and with this move to the Big East, DePaul had set itself up for future recruiting success as well. They capitalized on this announcement almost immediately by making the NCAA tournament that season, earning a 7 seed and actually winning a game before bowing out to eventual national champion and future conference foe UConn in the second round. But soon after, things started to change. 2005 saw DePaul miss the tournament despite posting a respectable 20-11 and 11 record, and then to make things worse, Virginia liked what they saw from Lato and decided to swallow the five-year buyout on his DePaul contract to bring him to Charlottesville. To put it nicely, DePaul had just gotten big brother, and they now entered a new conference with a new leader, Jerry Wainwright, a seasoned head coach who had local ties to the Chicago area and had brought both UNC Wilmington and Richmond to NCAA tournaments in his career. Unfortunately though, Wainwright only lasted four and a half seasons and his time at DePaul kind of set the stage for the program that would ultimately become the laughing stock of the Big East. He was fired in the middle of the 2009-10 campaign after accumulating a record of 59-80, and with the low point coming in the 2009 season where the Blue Demons went 0-18 in the Big East, becoming the first team to do so since Miami in 1994. Up next was Oliver Purnell, who they managed to bring in from Clemson, where he had just made three straight NCAA tournaments, but even he couldn't figure out how to win at DePaul either, lasting five years and never managing to win more than 12 games in a single season. So once again, DePaul needed to find another new coach in the offseason of 2015, but this time it wasn't totally new. Athletic director at the time, Gene Lenti Ponsetto, who had overseen all the previous hires mentioned, took some advice from those Matthew McConaughey Lincoln commercials. Sometimes you gotta go back to actually move forward and decided to bring back Dave Lato, who had only lasted four seasons at Virginia before abruptly resigning in 2009. Lato hadn't coached college basketball in six years, and he left DePaul out to dry by leaving for Virginia, but that didn't matter. They rehired him anyway and it wasn't better the second time around. As Lato's second stint in Chicago lasted six seasons with no NCAA tournament appearances and only one season over 500. So now it was 2021, and DePaul once again was in the market for a new head coach. And luckily, Gene Lenti Ponsetto had retired the previous June. So for once, DePaul fans, if there were any left, had some hope that maybe things would start changing under the leadership of newly appointed AD Dwayne Peavy. Spoiler alert, they haven't. With a chance to get some positive momentum around the program for the first time in 20 years, PV and DePaul made the decision to hire Tony Stubblefield, a man who had no ties to the area and had no real head coaching experience outside of an interim stint at New Mexico State in 2005 where he went 2-12. But don't worry guys, DePaul only hired him because Kenny Payne, yes, that Kenny Payne, had already said no. 
and they didn't want to deal with some young guy who had grown up in the Chicago land area, had studied under the greatest college coach ever, was considered one of the best recruiters in the sport, and was ready to take the job if offered. Yeah, who would want him? So now here we are in 2023, where Stubblefield has just started his third season with losses to Purdue Fort Wayne and Long Beach State. And honestly, given the lack of talent on the roster combined with the lack of recruiting, things aren't getting better. But at the same time, it's hard to fully blame the string of bad coaching hires for DePaul's lack of basketball success. You can still blame DePaul, but the coaching hires are only one part of the equation. Outside of personnel decisions, the fact of the matter is that DePaul isn't a school that's built to be good in basketball. For one thing, the fan experience is absolutely miserable. I'm sure some of us saw the reported attendance numbers from opening night, which clocked in at 931 people per ESPN. And perhaps what's even more pathetic about this is that DePaul actually came out after and said that 2,940 people were there, as if that's any better for an arena that seats over 10,000. And for the record, I was there on opening night, and believe me, there's no way attendance was anywhere close to 3,000. But why is attendance so low? Well, a lot has to do with the product on the floor. DePaul isn't a good team, and they weren't playing a good team. So naturally, it's not going to have the juice of some other marquee matchups. But another key reason is that Wintrust Arena is a whopping seven miles away from DePaul's main campus. Why would any college student make that trek to watch some bad basketball? In fact, the only time Wintrust Arena has sold out for a DePaul game was last year when Marquette came to town. And if you listen to that crowd on replays, you could tell it was basically Marquette South for the afternoon. Find some advantages if you just are patient. from Tyler Kolek. And perhaps what's even worse about this is that DePaul just started playing in Wintrust Arena when it was built in 2017. Before that, they played in Allstate Arena, a cavernous 17,000-seat stadium in Rosemont, Illinois, that's now mainly used for concerts and the AHL's Chicago Wolves. So before DePaul upgraded to a 7-mile distance for its arena, they used to make students head out to Rosemont, which is 15 miles away from the main campus area. And if you know anything about Chicago traffic, you'd know 15 miles is no joke. Naturally, this makes for one of the worst environments in major college basketball, which does very little to fire up recruits. And in addition to that, any home field advantage DePaul may have with Chicago area prospects is slowly becoming less influential because of the talent exodus in the Illinois high school basketball scene. Over the years, the Chicagoland area has seen talented guys like J.J. Taylor, Naimari Burnett, Amari Bailey, Khalil Whitney, Cam Kraft, Jeremiah Fears, and James Brown all leave the state in order to play at prep schools in various areas of the country, and this trend has really left the state barren of high-level Division I prospects. Gone are the days of Jabari Parker, Jaleel Okafor, and Jalen Brunson, and this ultimately hurts the Blue Demons when it comes to establishing a local recruiting footprint, because if they can't sell home, what exactly can they sell? So, since DePaul announced their intent to join the Big East in 2003, They've had more head coaches than 500 seasons. They've moved from a very annoying arena to get to to a slightly less annoying arena to get to. They've seen its natural recruiting base become a shell of itself, and of course, have added these two losses to open the current season. I would say this is rock bottom, but what exactly is rock bottom for a program that has no recent success, no fan excitement, no recruiting base, and no solid coach? Maybe the new practice facility is the spark DePaul needs to turn things around. Maybe they embrace the Sullivan Athletic Center, their on-campus 3,000-seat arena, to host at least some of their home games. Maybe they take another crack at hiring a head coach. But do I think any of these things are going to help them compete at a respectable level anytime soon? No. There are just so many issues at DePaul that the school seemingly creates for itself, and then when you add in the problems they can't necessarily control, it's clear that the once proud program has become a basketball wasteland. And the 0-2 start to open the 2023-24 season was just another nail in the coffin of a program that has already been dead for a very long time. Thanks so much for watching and give me your thoughts below.